Hi. Uh, I guess it's good evening right now at Pakistan. Um, this is the SJS to Japan Space Talk. And today's guest is Jima Majid, uh, and again, from Pakistan. And she is currently a uh, student uh, in the medical field, am I correct? Um, and um, also a space educator um, in Pakistan as well. So with that, um, I will have you introduce yourself. Thank you, Sam. Uh, hello, everyone. As Sam told you guys that I am a student of medical lab technology and a space educator. And today I'm here to talk uh, about my experience of uh, space education and uh, the discrimination that most of the time we face about women in space or women in STEM in general. So uh, I'm going to give some do's and don'ts about space education. I started my space education uh, journey four years ago and I worked as a nonprofit uh, for almost two and a half years. So first thing first, uh, you have to gain a lot of experience for that you should volunteer. So I kind of volunteered for different organizations for two years. And after two years, I had enough experience that I started my own thing. Point number two is the second do, do is if you are good at something, never do it for free. So, mm -hmm. After working for free for two years, it was my time when I was getting good at it, but it was taken for granted. So the third point is actually free, free is for granted in general. When something don't have any price tag or something is being offered free, people often take it for granted that, okay, it might, doesn't have any value. Uh, so if you're good at something, don't do it for free. And then I started charging a very, uh, minimal price for my session and for my workshops. It actually helped me. Uh, so th that was my turning moment when I actually started social entrepreneurship. I never ever imagined and I had no, uh, you can say I had no plans to step into social entrepreneurship. But uh, it, it was important for me because, uh, what should I mention? People take my sessions for granted and it was really hard for me to manage all, um, you can say the financials, which was very difficult for me to manage. When you go to a school, schools ask you to like give gifts to our students or give certificates or give some space souvenirs to our students so that they can remember. What I did for two years, I used to save my pocket money and print some very cute space related stickers just to distribute among students so that they can actually uh, remember that they uh, had an experience with someone who came to their school and told them some stuff about space. At the same time, my uh, I have this rule that uh, full space is for everyone. So I believe that no child should be left behind uh, from learning any kind of like anything from any kind of learning just on the basis of financial barriers. So I tried to make my campaign, my space education campaign uh, sustainable. I wanted a way which could generate my funds that I can actually teach for free to the underprivileged kids. So making some little souvenirs for kids was very, it, it became really very easy. So what you can do is you can charge private schools and then you can like take out some revenue and give out free sessions to underprivileged schools. It helped me in the sense because uh, people actually started taking it seriously. Uh, I, I would talk here, uh, specifically about Pakistan, I don't know about, I don't know much about other countries, but in Pakistan, our space program is not well developed and uh, schools usually do not focus on the science. So schools did not used to allow me to come and teach kids about some subject that is not giving them jobs. But when I put a price tag and when they saw that uh, 
there is a proper campaign and this person has specific experience with various uh, international organization, including Space Generation Advisory Council, it actually helped me a lot. Uh, so I would say that volunteering is your gaining experience. Uh, the second thing is you should charge a bit from private schools, from those kids who can actually afford your workshop or they can afford your session so that you can teach underprivileged kids for free. And uh, the third thing, very important, is your content, what you are teaching. Because when it comes to educating someone, uh, a single teacher is educating a class of 50 students, for example. So it's very important for that educator to know things uh, correctly and he or she should have very authentic information what he or she is delivering to the kids. So you should make your content engaging as well as authentic. For that, we have a lot of websites on internet. We have a lot of free content available on NASA, ESA, or CSA websites. A lot of experience, uh, experiments are already designed and they are available over there. Uh, the last thing I would say that uh, do not look to other organizations to give you funding. Generate your own funding. I have heard this big excuse from a lot of people that we cannot do this because we don't have funds. You can actually generate your own funds. You can actually generate your own content. If you have internet and you are using internet and its information correctly, you can use it to make your own content and then you can sell your uh, content as a product. And uh, maybe these terms that I'm using uh, sounds very uh, marketing related, but uh, when it comes to education, it, it helps you to generate funds for underprivileged kids mm -hmm. uh, who can hardly get any chance to learn about space or to look at the skies or anything like that. So yes, do not look at other organizations to give you any sort of funding. Generate your own funds, generate your own content. But I have learned from uh, my space four years of space education journey is when you have good engaging content and your experience, then people do take you seriously. Mm -hmm. So my advice to all educators or anyone who wants to go and teach little kids is to make your content engaging and authentic. Read from proper resources. Uh, over here, I have seen countless examples where educators are forwarding wrong scientific information. That is very toxic because one educator is forwarding the wrong information to a class of 20 students or the class of 50 students. Uh, and the students would deny it because they would say that it is something that is being taught to us at schools. Uh, so yes, making authentic and engaging content and making it a, make, uh, a bit about uh, branding your content can help you to promote space education to like beyond the skies because uh, I have seen almost every kid is inspired by stars and uh, specifically uh, when it comes to space education, it's group of your students matters a lot. If you are trying to teach black holes or solar system to a preschooler, it will not work. Uh, you can give them space toys, they can make an inspiration, but they will not learn a lot. If you are teaching age group of like uh, primary and secondary school, it will actually spark their interest in the field of science. At the same time, if you are going to teach this to high school students with some proper experiments, yes, it will make impact. Uh, but if you are telling any other profession, for example, university students, uh, if I am going to take some styrofoam balls and paints to a university student and start teaching them about uh, space and planets, it will not have that impact. So when you are creating your content, then please keep in your mind what age group you are trying to create an impact on. 
because there is different kind of content for different kind of age group. Uh, what age group I target is uh, six to 14 years old because it's easy for me. Uh, also, I don't have any professional degree in astronomy or space sciences. So it helps me to study the content which is already available on the internet and then make those experiments uh, locally. Uh, here comes another point that uh, we should not uh, look to other organizations to send us uh, any material. If you can make an experiment locally, if you can gather some material, if you can gather some pipes and some tires or some wires locally, then you can actually design your own thing. You can actually design your own uh, experiment kit. This is uh, something that I really, really experienced a lot and learned a lot in my uh, four years journey. It, it helps a lot. So instead of looking to other organizations or other countries for funding, for material or for anything, if you just stand up and try to make something on your own. And if you do not have opportunity from outer resources, then create opportunity for yourself. I would say it's, it's in my case that I had no opportunity over here. So I created a thing of my own and I worked really hard and for a long time that I am here now. And there's a huge role of SGAC. I remember I, I have been stalking all SGAC people on social media since I was 16 years old. And I used to wait, okay, when I will turn 18, I will join SGAC. So, so I joined SGAC when I was 18 and then I like started working. I explored a lot. I used to learn a lot from, uh, from the things you guys used to post on social media. Even that was a very uh, great learning experience for me. So yes, one can learn if there is a room of, uh, like if there is passion of learning and room of improvement. Yeah, so that is about space education. And I said, I will talk about women in space in the end. Mm -hmm. about yeah, women um, in space. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, um, just to, um, for the audience, um, if you have any questions, please post it on the chat and then we can answer it um, for the last three minutes. Um, so yeah, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, go ahead. No problem. So about women in space, um, Around me, people uh, hardly use this term. Uh, the people around me, they, they are not much concerned about space since our space program is not much well developed. Uh, but when I attended recent uh, conference in uh, Nagoya, I led women in space group with uh, Shreya, uh, another member of uh, Space Ed Generation Advisory Council. And uh, from there, I, I learned this, that we really, really had a very less ratio of uh, women in space because I actually don't have uh, met a lot of space people in general over here and that was my first experience and I, I felt that a lot that we have a really, really uh, less ratio of women. Our group name was Women in Space and it was really funny. No, no men actually joined the group, the space industry. But uh, maybe it created some sort of impression that I guess only one man, yes, uh, there was only one man who joined that group. And uh, I, I really wish that other people would have, other men should have joined to know what problems we face so that they can help us and work together to minimize those problems, I would say like uh, the report we made uh, first of all we we have very few uh, female role models and even if we when we do have female role models uh, they stay unknown uh, their work stay unknown their journey the journey stays unknown uh, i like so that they can inspire young girls and uh, women to actually take a step in STEM degree. Apart from that, what, uh, what I am 
I'm planning uh, uh, for my space education campaign over here is, uh, uh, which is not just to like empower them or train them. It is more about giving them confidence that they can do it. Over here, when I go to different schools, uh, boys campus and girls campus, girls are uh, hesitant in taking steps. They don't uh, take, uh, take signs confidently. They're hesitant. But as compared to boys, boys are so much into science. Uh, they want to do experiments. They are actually really okay. If they are breaking things, it's fine. But girls uh, do not try to do some experience just with the fear that what will happen if the equipment breaks. So we have to tell them that it's okay if something during the experiment is broken. Okay, we, we do have to take precautionary measures and we should not break something on purpose. But it's okay. Things are made for experiments. So we need to give a lot of uh, encouragement and confidence to our girls. Apart from mm -hmm. that, we should have equal representation of male and female employees. For example, we have uh, national coordinators from SGACs. And it is always a pleasure for me whenever I see a female uh, coordinator. Uh, before me, there was no female coordinator. Uh, but whenever I came across any profile that a female is doing this in STEM, not, not just in space, it's really inspiring for me. When I see any Pakistani woman doing something big in the field of STEM, I actually try, I, I search on entire internet about their contact details. I write them emails that your story is so inspiring and it's helping me. Mm -hmm. Recently, my uh, interview came on internet and become viral. I started receiving messages from little girls that uh, your journey is inspiring and we want to become an astronaut too and things like that. I, I feel so encouraged, not because my interview came out, but because I am creating some impact. If my journey or if my work is helping a young girl to have an inspiration that they can uh, become an astronaut or they can become what they want to be. I go to different schools and my main agenda is not just to inspire uh, kids to become an astronaut or to become a space engineer. I want them to pursue their passions. I want them to never, never ever give up on uh, their dreams. Even if they want to become an artist, they should. If they want to become an astronaut, work hard for it. They, they can become an astronaut. Uh, so yes, everyone should be motivated. And I think for women, women in uh, space specifically, we should have equal representation and our government should give us highlight as well as some scholarships can be generated which will be awarded especially for women so that women are more encouraged to take part in STEM related fields. That's it for me. I just got a message that we are about to start question answer session. Mm -hmm. So if you want to speak up, um, you could and you just unmute your mic um, or you could pay, uh, post it on chat. Um, if there are no, no questions, um, and Tucker and I do have some questions, so we can um, ask you some. Um, does that sound good? Yes. Okay. Um, your oh, okay. Yep. Um, Tucker, did you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I actually have quite a few. Um, I I was really curious as to. Um, you mentioned that um, in Pakistan there isn't a clear path in space and that was what uh, was uh, sort of a uh, setback for you in the beginning. Um, what is the current uh, situation about space like in Pakistan? Like can you talk about like Over, what the agency is like? Uh, are there businesses that do sort of space related things? We, we do have uh, our space agency. Pakistan has a national space agency, which is SPARCO. 
uh, but they work very secretly and all their missions are very confidential. Uh, their public engagement is almost uh, zero. They, they hardly engage much public apart from that one year World Space Week celebration, that's it. They, they don't have much public engagement, so they are sending satellites in space. But unfortunately, we have no plans for astronaut program. And the satellites we are sending is with the help of a Chinese space agency. Uh, but in the journey of past four years, uh, I, I have observed that there is a lot of demand and a lot of awareness among general public uh, regarding space and, uh, and astronomy. So people are getting awareness. I hope when people are getting awareness, they will actually adopt these things as a carrier. Uh, but education is also a huge barrier. So over here, um, we don't have really good universities which are offering uh, astronomy programs. So for astronomy related degrees, we have astrophysics on PhD level or astronomy at PhD level. We, we don't have it on a bachelor's level or not even in our schools. So, so that's also a barrier for students that even if they want to join it, they cannot because uh, like securing a scholarship in some other universities is not a piece of cake for everyone as well. But I am glad that people are getting enough awareness and they are raising their voice about starting our own better space programs. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Um, what in your program, uh, in your outreach program to, um, to students and children, uh, what specifically do you teach? Um, what subjects? Very basic, yes. Uh, it's like uh, uh, workshops on a single topic. It's very basic, like uh, starting from constellations. So one workshop is about constellation, which will have two to three activities hands-on activities which are related to constellations then it's about solar system so unfortunately we still have some books which says that mercury is the hottest planet of our solar system and pluto is a planet or it's not a planet uh, so it's like demystifying space myths that we have in our society so constellations, solar system, then space rocks are very, very exciting for kids that how something from space just fell into the earth, uh, which is often linked with uh, how dinosaurs were killed, and it becomes even more interesting for kids. Uh, then one session is about uh, space arts that I have been conducting for past past three years, I guess, with NASA astronaut Nicole Stott. So we paint space themed artwork and send it to astronauts and sometimes in space at International Space Station. Anyone from any country can find that amazing project, the artworks, collect them, collect artworks from different countries, make a collective artwork and then send it to space or exhibit at different parts of the country. So there are different kind of projects that I have been teaching or I have interviewed at for some of it. And um, for the audience, I'll read out the question and then um, you can answer that. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw a question in the chat box that is from Shreya that how I am keeping, in, uh, keeping kids engaged during COVID-19. So trying to make more uh, virtual sessions, but not very long and not very regular. It's like one session per month is fine, but creating that one session amazingly exciting for kids is very important because they're already taking their school classes online, which is very hectic for them. So what I am doing is, uh, I did my first uh, virtual workshop in collaboration with the storytelling club in which uh, the storyteller made some very, very funny space related story. Uh, and I 
uh, taught them uh, moon phases activity which they can do with oreo so we have to put at least one element which excite kids a lot oreo biscuits is something that is very exciting for kids and everyone almost every kid love oreo biscuits so they were very they were enjoying the sessions and they actually did their experiment after my workshop and sent me photos similarly i then the second session i did was with astronaut nicole uh, and that was uh, for the first time for the kids to live talk with a real astronaut because pakistan don't have their own astronaut so this is something that that is very rare for pakistan kids so that session was mind blowing i would say in my journey of 4 years that was my the most productive session maximum students registered i got amazing response not just from kids but also from their parents so if a session is virtual we have to engage them in some different way which is even more exciting from them for them bring new experiments and make it very easy that they can collect the material from their uh, house for example i am my upcoming workshop is about mars rover so we have launched three rovers this year like one from china dubai and america so everyone is crazy about rovers rovers so i'm going to teach kids about rovers and how we can make a mini cardboard rover and we can color it we can paint it so th this is something that kids can relate to the current situation uh, rover launch is very viral all over the internet so kids can actually relate to it and and they can enjoy so i try to put some exciting elements for kids though i teach uh, younger kids so it's a uh, it's not very easy to make them uh, happy and exciting but yes you can at the same time if i say that i'm going to teach a cardboard rover to a university or high school student uh, i know that's not going to work so yes that's how i make uh, i try to make my workshops engaging it's interesting that you're actually getting the kids to do their own things instead of you just showing uh experiments and what not uh, keeping the kids engaged thank you anything else uh, i have a follow up question about um you creating your own own content as opposed to just taking things um that are available um i thought that was a really interesting point um both from a facilitation point of view um and also for just for independence uh, yes. of your project um in creating your content you mentioned that uh, you could use the internet to uh to find information um in doing so i do use internet content which is available for free of course and uh, but all the material given in those uh, experiments is not available in my country so i try to make them locally to make them like produce locally so this includes a lot of uh, weird material sometimes i have to i have to visit shops that are related to pvc pipes and construction materials and sand papers things like that wires and batteries uh, this is considered very awkward for a girl to go to a pvc pipe shop and bring pipes for something everyone asked that why do you need pipes uh, but it was not necessary to mention that i am going to make a rocket launcher out of pvc pipes <laughs> so that rocket launcher is actually for an activity that i designed for kids i i don't uh, go for water rockets because Uh, that is a lot of work and i couldn't find proper blueprints and i couldn't find any carpenter to make me that, that proper water rocket thing so i opted for a stomp rocket kit and i made it locally so i do take content from internet but i have to improvise and i have to improvise it a lot according to the material i have over here according to the age group i am teaching interesting um 
you also mentioned about uh, in information on the internet. Uh, there are some that are not correct, like saying uh, what Pluto, Pluto is still a planet and things. Um, when you see that kind of information, how do you uh, personally verify that? There was a... uh, I couldn't get your question. Ah, uh, when you see like int information on the internet, uh, how do you verify it to see if it's real or not? Anything on internet or interview on internet? Uh, information on the internet. And information on internet. Yeah. So, of course, first of all, I have to read and I have to read it in the perspective that is it useful for me or mm -hmm. not? So, it has two points. Is it useful for my outreach campaign or is it useful information to keep in my brain for my career or for my general knowledge? So when, when it is something related to my work and for example, it is some information given by another organization. So I will do some more research about their work and then sometimes I send them an offer of collaboration that you are doing this activity, I'm doing this activity, let's let's make something together so that we can reach a larger audience and create a bigger impact. And if it is important information about my general knowledge or for my career, then of course I read it, try to, not try to memorize it, but keep bookmarks and check them again if I'm Nice. Um, that actually brings me to another question I have is if that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's just me talking. Um, so what, what is your personal career goal? Do you have like a long-term plan, uh, five, 10, 15 years? Uh, it's, uh, it's to become an astronaut. Nice. To become an astronaut and a very, a very good geneticist. I am, uh, I'm interested in genetic diseases, human genetic diseases, and uh, human health during space travel in general. So if not astronaut, because I know astronaut is a very big goal, and it's like uh, one in a million kind of thing, uh, but to become a good researcher and uh, to serve people with science is, I can say, my larger goal. I want to bring change with science. That's a really, uh, really cool goal to have. Not just astronaut, but really create um, spreading science, uh, more science into the world. I, I guess. Is, is there a um, so you mentioned you want to you want to be an astronaut? Um, is there an astronaut from Pakistan in the past or? No, no, no okay. not yet. We don't have a poor astronaut program and. Uh, out of approximate 600 people who have been to space, none of them was a Pakistani. Nine people were Muslim. Hmm. There have been a Muslim female astronaut, Muslim male astronauts, uh, but none of them was Pakistani. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you have a space agency? Yes, we do. Okay. It's a SPARCO, Space uh, Atmosphere Research Center. Okay. Okay. Well, so then, you know, they might, you know, have have astronaut program in the future. Then, you know, you could apply. Uh, maybe you don't have any current plans for an astronaut program, but yes, I'm trying to raise enough uh, enough awareness, and I just don't want them to start a an astronaut program. I want government and our uh, policy makers to include astronomy as a permanent subject mm -hmm. in our schools so mm -hmm. that kids can learn it in general when you say school is it um for like universities or a little more um young, at no, a younger it's, age uh, in primary and secondary schools at least mm -hmm. so that if they have developed some interest they can take that subject uh, for further career, for example, in high school and then in their universities. Okay, I see. Well, are there, um, um, you, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, but are, are there um, any university programs um, in Pakistan that's related there to are, space? There are, which, uh, which are 
about space sciences, not, not astronomy, but there are some about satellite engineering, space mm -hmm. sciences, uh, geosatellite engineering, uh, but they're not a lot. They are not government institutes, they are private institutes, private universities. Uh, it's, it's hard to get jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and if not, and then it's hard to get scholarships for a master's degree, which mm -hmm. is of course, out of Pakistan. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, so, so then even if you proceed oh, in yes. the sense, oh. Uh, there's another question by Yasser. Oh. All right, well, let's yes. go. Yes. Yep. So um, uh, that, that's a very good question. That how can uh, we brainwash the kids and students who are already filled with fraud data about space? Since we all know Pakistan is a yeah. So is the thing recently when I when I did a session with astronaut Nicole, uh, there was a question raised by uh, a very young kid that is it true moon landing and uh, moon landings were fake. This is a question. Um, a parent came to my workshop and uh, he argued a lot with me that moon landings were fake. I tried my best to give him fact about uh, it was true, but again, it's very uh, hard because they have that data recorded in their mind. But I asked astronaut Nicole to kindly explain that thing. Astronaut Nicole is someone who has been to the space twice and kids actually listen to her. That, that, uh, that was uh, really impactful. Talking to Nicole was in, in, impactful because if I am telling kids that this is true, moon landing is true, they might not trust me, but they are trusting a person who has actually been to space twice. Like they can just Google her name, they read her entire Wikipedia profile, and made sure that yes, this is a real astronaut. She has been to space. And when she answered all of their questions, they trusted her and they do agree that, okay, moon landings were true. Now we do agree. So that's why I, in lockdown, I am trying to get more uh, space professionals who can talk to kids, not just talk to elders or university students, talk to kids and answer their questions, their space mysteries. It, it can give them hope, it can inspire them. How, how, so in Pakistan, my understanding is that, you know, as you mentioned, there are not a lot of space experts. Um, and, you know, you invite, um, like you say, astronauts from, uh, that are in a foreign country, you know, um, um, how do you actually do that? Do you like contact, NASA or like how, how do you, you know, um, get in touch with them? Well, I would say correct use of internet, uh, okay. social media <laughs> and a lot of uh, volunteering and honesty. So I have been working with astronaut Nicole since 2017. I was very young when I contacted her organization, Paris Space for Art Foundation. I contacted them and insisted that Pakistan wants to be at work and sending it to space. Uh, it took me some time, but she agreed and my performance was good. I gave her the proof of the virtuals of activities and share it with uh, her foundation that I am actually working on her project over here. So yes, that's how we, I think that's how we create a trustworthy bond so after three years, even that session was my first time that I was talking to astronaut Nicole. And in the collaboration of three years, uh, we, we had never had a conversation like that. Nicole, as in Nicole Scott? Yes, Nicole Scott. Wow. Nicole Scott. Wow. That's, Nicole that's Scott. wow. You must have been uh, re really excited about uh, APSGW last year when we had uh, astronaut um, Onishi as our guest. Yes. yes, but unfortunately, I had to leave early. Oh, yeah. So I, I left a few hours. Yes, I left a few hours ago. 
Uh, oh, the no. day when astronaut, I guess astronaut, uh, a Japanese astronaut was invited. So it was my bad. My, my flight was scheduled earlier. So I had to come back. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Meeting a real life astronaut is like a dream. Every astronaut excites me. And I would say that every astronaut is my favorite astronaut. It's not just a single astronaut who is my favorite. Every astronaut is my favorite astronaut. That's a good answer. <laughs> How many astronauts have you met um, until now? I, I think approximately 600 or uh, according to the data of 2018, I guess there were 568 astronauts. But when we include commercial astronauts or the space tourists, then uh, there is a bigger number. Because commercial astronauts and space tourists are those who are not selected by government space agents. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how many astronauts have you met um, out of those like 600 astronauts? I think 568 and the ratio of uh, female astronauts is not even 50%. It's around, I guess, 10%, 10 or 18%. Female astronauts out of the entire pool of astronauts. Okay. Okay. Um. So then, are, are, do you have like any plans um, moving forward in terms of you know your project, your education? What what kind of you know? Uh, well, you you've mentioned you know about the Mar Mars rover um, project, um, but yeah. like maybe like in you know a little more further future, are there so any things that you would like to do? So the general plans for exploration and my face outreach campaign is to make a team because I have been working alone for a long time. And then uh, for, for my career, I, I want to focus on my degree first. I want to be a good researcher. I want to gain a lot of experience in my field. And uh, yes, there's another goal of staying physically fit, which is very important for an astronaut. But I have not even touched that goal so far. How, how so you, you're, you're in your, uh, so you, you're, you're studying, um, you're in your, you're trying to get your medical degree right now, right? Um, and how long um, do you have left? Yes, it's, it's, um, I am about to graduate in, uh, in a few months. It oh, was due to okay. pandemic, otherwise I would have been graduated by, by April 2020. Okay. Is that like your um, sort of like bachelor's or master's or PhD or what kind of degree would that be? Yes, I, I want to take a gap year and then my master's degree, I guess. Okay. I, I think this 2020 was a gap year for everyone. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> But I want to take out some time for myself and to decide what I want to study further, and then I will apply for a master's. Are you planning? So, if you do proceed in your master's, are you planning with, uh, to, you know, get your degree within Pakistan or like somewhere else, or like, are there any things that you, you're that, thinking that's, about? That's that's a big question. Okay. I I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have not mm -hmm. decided much about it but uh, I will see first I have to decide what uh, discipline I want to study what subjects mm -hmm. I I want to study and then I have to apply of course I will try some international universities but it, I'm not for sure that I can get admission into them mm -hmm. uh, I want to switch topics and ask about uh, women in space um, back in APSGW, I noticed that, yes, all the members were women, and um, the guest, um, uh, Lena Okajima, was uh, concerned about that, too. Um, what do you think is the biggest issue uh, about uh, women, uh, or in women pursuing a career in space? Uh, what, uh, I, I maybe couldn't get your question completely. 
completely, but uh, yes, there was a group at the conference about women in space group. And I mentioned earlier that uh, in that group, we all were female. We were expecting some males to join as well uh, because they should work closely with us to see what problems do we, uh, do we have. Uh, we need an empowering and a space, uh, a safe space uh, for everyone to work. And uh, I forgot to mention one thing uh, when I was discussing women in space uh, that even in, uh, in general, uh, women needs to empower women as well. Uh, this is not something that is only applied on males in the industry. Women, uh, those women who are already uh, in leading positions or those who are already working in uh, space, they should encourage their juniors and they should encourage other females and empower them to join space sector or STEM in general. What do you think is the biggest obstacle there? Is it the lack of role models? I guess the lack of confidence. Mm. Uh, this is something uh, we are grown up with. Uh, we, we have this thing in our mind due to our society and cultural pressure that a girl cannot do this or a girl is not supposed to do this. A girl has to get married, so it doesn't matter if a girl has a PhD degree because in the end she has to get married and become becomes a housewife and to take care of the household household work uh, work. So I think that's a lack of confidence, lack of any kind of hope that even if a girl is taking a scientific degree, there are people who come and keeps discouraging her that no matter if you are studying science, uh, that's your end. You're taking care of a house. You cannot work in a real private sector. So I think lack of confidence is uh, the main barrier. Right. And I guess some of that is created by men or in society in general. Um, how can uh, men help? Uh, with that situation? I uh, guess, continue. Oh, what is it? Oh, take a guess? Yes. Uh, well, uh, for me personally, I would think um, encouraging it, um, not saying, oh, because you are a woman kind of thing. Uh, whatever they're mm -hmm. interested in, uh, I would support. Um, I personally, growing up, I I had a lot of female um, leaders around me, so I never had that sort of belief that women can't uh, do um, everything, and uh, that was something that was taught to me later on that there was a lot of stigma attached with uh, women pursuing their own goals. Surroundings, uh, surroundings of a person does matter. Mm. Uh, like, I uh, I am from a country where there is a lot of gender imbalance, I would say culturally. So there are other countries where there is no such uh, cultural or religious barriers, but still uh, the number of women in wor working in STEM field is less. Uh, so that's the point where I think that there is a general barrier, uh, regardless of religion, regardless of culture or pressure from society. There is a general barrier, which is, uh, stopping uh, women from all backgrounds, all countries to confidently step in uh, in a STEM degree or in a working field. Right. Yeah. Um, so the um, time is getting closer to the end. Um, there was one comment from Yassi um, saying, you know, um, this is not related to space, um, but Yuma is uh, good in singing too. So, you know, our next session could be, you know, you singing. Um, <laughs> if no, no, wait, hey, this is, uh, this is Yasit. No, actually, I'm not, but Yasit is. Yasit is a very good singer. He did a very good karaoke man, I remember. He's very good at, very senior at. He's a pro, actually. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, she had SJ. She should have like a uh, karaoke event one time. Um, but anyhow, um, thank you very much for your time today. Um, we did post a survey on the chat. So for those who are reviewing today, um, if you have time, please answer the um, uh, survey and then uh, we will we'll greatly appreciate that. Um, again, and th this video will be uploaded on YouTube uh, later on. So if you missed some of the videos, please um, you know, uh, look that up later on as well. Um, so yeah, um, Nima, thank you very much for your time today. Um, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yep. Thanks. So yeah, this will be the end of the event. Thank you very much everyone for listening. Thank you.